Andy Brownell with Brownell Furniture. As a furniture maker for 20 years, I'm always looking for opportunities to try new styles and push my comfort zone. One style of furniture I've taken on recently is sculpted furniture like this that uses stack lamination as a method of construction and assembly. Now, a piece like this can look a little intimidating, but the reality is, is that stacked furniture follows a very simple set of rules and processes to go from basic rough pieces to something that's more refined like this piece. In this video, I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step process of how to build a piece like this, and you can use these skills and techniques and apply it to your own style, to your own furniture. Um, you can make a piece like this, or you can try something completely new. To be clear, this bench design is not my own. It's actually a modified, simplified version of a bench designed by Wendell Castle in 1964. I've made a few adjustments to make the power carving a little bit easier considering I'm still fairly new to the process. Australia-based Arbortech Tools has been kind enough to sponsor me over the last year as I've kind of embarked on learning how to build furniture like this. Uh, one tool that I use in particular for this project was their turbo plane. Uh, this is a kind of a cutting disc that has three carbide tips on it, attaches to any angle grinder, and it's really essential to make um, a piece with this type of form with uh, concave and convex shapes. So while this tool was essential for me to build this particular project, sculpted furniture uses a wide range of tools, ranging from chainsaws to chisels. So you can use this project and this video as a guide for learning the basics about fabrication, design, tool techniques, and finishing for a sculpted piece of furniture for yourself. My hope is that it inspires you to maybe take on this form of woodworking, give it a shot. So let's get started. I've used the compass to draw out the seven individual shapes of the laminated pieces and move to the bandsaw and cut away the waste. With all seven pieces cut, I move on to glue up. For the most part, stacked lamination is easiest done in stages. So for this project, I start with layers one through three and glue those up, and then I move on to layers four through seven. Once these are all dry, I glue them together as one continuous piece. Once the piece is dry, I unclamp it and move over to my drill press. I drill an inch and a half deep hole through the center of the base with a one and three eighths inch wide Forstner bit. I then move over to my bench and clean up the hole and square it off using corner chisels and paring chisels. This will allow for the floating tenon to connect the base to the seat bottom. Now it's time to move on to the seat for the bench. I've ripped this piece at 14 inches wide and now I'm cross-cutting it at 23 inches long on the table saw. With the seat cut to size, I've marked out a location at the middle of the seat bottom and drill a hole completely through the entire seat. This will allow for the floating tenon to make its way through. I then return to my workbench and chop out the waste, squaring off the hole for the floating tenon. The seat bottom has a gentle arch drawn in on all four sides, so I move to my bandsaw to remove most of the waste. Once I've cut all four sides, I then move to my workbench and smooth out all the sides with a block plane. So with the mortises cut and the tenon ready to go, I'm going to glue up the base and the top. Now this is a bit of a tricky glue up because it's so large and I need to clamp it around something that's going to really hold the top down to the base while it dries. So I'm actually going to use my smaller workbench and use that as a clamping surface with some extra wide clamps and we'll get it done. So with the base and the seat all glued up and dried, I've unclamped it and now I'm just going to remove the top of this tenon here uh, with a flush cutting saw. That'll make it easier for me to keep it level when I flip it upside down to work the underside of it. So now we're ready to start shaping the piece. I'm going to start with the base and I'm going to use the ArborTech turbo plane uh, on my angle grinder here uh, to really just start getting the general uh, hourglass shape of the base roughed out. It doesn't have to be too detailed right now, it's really just taking it from this into something that's a little bit more smooth and contoured and reflects what the final piece is going to be. I'll deal with the top of the seat and the bottom of the seat later on because I'm going to be flipping it up and down and I don't want to damage the final shape of the piece, so this gives me a little bit of leeway to work with there. This is also a very dusty process, so I'm not only covering myself pretty well here, I'm going to have a hood on, 
uh, eye protection as well as a dust mask and hearing protection. I'm also going to be running my dust collection system uh, just to kind of collect as much of the dust as I can. I've also contained the workshop, uh, at least a section of it. I've got it draped off so that I can at least keep some of the dust uh, consolidated into one section of it. So we'll get started. So after having used this product for a little while, I've realized that the best location for contacting the tool blade uh, to the material is somewhere around the 2 and 3 o'clock position. It allows you to smoothly and easily control the tool while removing a good deal of material. In this shot, I'm really hogging away a good deal of material. I'm taking a really aggressive cut, still making the contact point between the 2 and 3 o'clock position of the tool blade allows you to make almost like this chamfer cut and continue to create a smooth arc all the way around the entire piece. Now with any tool that's spinning at over 16,000 RPMs, it's important to maintain a level of control. So one trick that I've found is that when I'm making delicate repeat cuts, I position the tool against my body and use that as a pivot point, and it allows me to make a lot of consistent repeat fine cuts around the entire piece as I rotate. I've then rotated the piece and followed the same principle, making a lot of small, fine repeat cuts, pivoting the tool against my body to maintain a level of control. With the overall shape of the base established, I move on to the bottom of the seat. I'm shaping the seat bottom to follow a gentle curved line that you can see drawn on the edges of the seat in pencil. Now with the use of the tool, you can go a little bit flatter rather than just focusing on the two, three o'clock position. This allows you to remove a good deal of material along a larger, flatter surface. Now in this shot, you can see me again positioning the tool against my body and I'm creating a consistent rocking motion almost to follow a very consistent line. This allows me to maintain a good deal of control as I get closer to the line at the edge of the seat. Before carving the top of the seat, I've drawn out a grid along the entire surface and I'm drilling a series of progressively shallower holes as I move away from the middle of the seat. This allows me to create a consistent scooping shape as I'm carving away the material and gives me a reference point to know when to stop carving. Now it's time to start removing the material. I begin at the middle, and again, I focus on really hogging away a lot of the waste at that 2 to 3 o'clock position. Again, you can see I'm using a lot of consistent arcing movements across a large portion of the piece. This allows me to maintain a level of control. As I go deeper, you can see that I'm getting closer to the bottom as the holes disappear that I had drilled earlier. Again, continuous sweeping motions allow you to maintain a level of control with the tool it makes it easier to remove the waste. I'm also positioning it much flatter against the surface to create a smooth, consistent cut. With continued use, you'll also start to notice that the tool's rotation creates almost a gyroscopic feel, and it gives you the ability to create a very fine level of balance and delicate control over the entire piece. So with all the power carving out of the way, now it's time to start really working on refining the overall shape of, of the stool. So it's going to require a combination of hand tools and power tools to really smooth this out in a way that's going to have a nice, clean, organic feel before I actually start applying any finish. I start with my spoke shave, which allows me to remove a lot of the high spots and gives me a level of control over the gentle arc of the seat. I move on to my block plane to flatten it out, and again move back to my spoke shave here to really clean up a lot of the edges as it tapers down. The spoke shave also works really well along the base, but I'm using files and rasps to refine the curve of the neck of the base. On the top of the seat, instead of using some hand tools, I'm going to use this random orbit sander. This is the Festool ETS 125. Um, I'm going to start out with 80 grit and see how it does in terms of smoothing out some of these bumps. See if I can get to a smooth surface without using hand tools. It should be able to give this uh, a good run for its money, so we'll get started. Now hand tools are always an option for removing material like this and smoothing out the surface. Cabinet scrapers and curved bottom spoke shaves work just as well. However, a random orbit sander with a flexible backing pad and 80 grit sandpaper really made this process much easier. It gave me a good level of control to smooth out the entire curved surfaces. So the finish I'm going to use on this is a uh, white bond finish and it's a special formula from Jeff Miller. 
Um, Jeff uh, has taught me for years, and I'm taking his advice on this particular finish. It's a combination of mineral spirits, uh, Balin's rock hard tabletop varnish, uh, and uh, pure tongue oil. So uh, we'll give this a shot and we'll see how it goes. It's going to probably soak in quite a bit. So I'll be generous, especially on the end grain. For the complete recipe, as well as the instructions on how to apply this finish, which includes subsequent wet sanding, you can go to my Instagram page at Brownell Furniture for more information.